Hi and welcome to this week's GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on the show we have a look at the Starling single speed downhill bike, which is pretty crazy, uh, Nootproof 2022 frame sets, uh, and also limited edition model, uh, titanium hardtail frame from Portugal, super nice this is. Uh, and some cool stuff for new lot. Okay, let's keep it snappy and jump straight into news this week. And first up, not news as such, but actually something very cool shared by Intend on their Instagram page. And uh, it's not often that we sort of see this sort of thing being shared. So here it is on screen. And it's essentially a design concept and they're sharing this basically to show that they've done this first. And it's a really cool concept. So back in the day, if you think that open oil bar suspension forks like the classic Marzocchi Z1 would literally be full of oil on the inside and have coil springs on the inside there as well. And that oil by nature of the fork, it, during its telescopic nature, um, going up and down essentially, would lubricate itself, self-lubricating if you like. So that is why those forks lasted so well. Unfortunately, that system is heavy uh, and perhaps it's not just as refined as some of the damping systems you see today. Now, one of the downsides of damping systems you see today are the fact that you will have a sealed damper on the inside of your fork, and then you've essentially got fresh air around it. Now, good side is it's a very good sealed unit, but the downside is it's not lubricating the fork bushings in the same way. Now, yes, you can add lubrication into those lower legs, and by capillary action, it will make its way up there, but still, it's not like a perfect system. And uh, what Intend appear to have done here is by using the pressure under compression, it forces the oil that sits at the bottom of the legs up through the tube and to the top of the bushings. So as the fork extends again, it pulls the, uh, pulls the oil past the bushings. So in theory, they're always lubricated uh, and always super slippery in action. I just think that's really cool. Uh, that's all. If you don't really follow them, give them a follow. Instagram link is right there. Okay, next up is a Portuguese frame manufacturer making some very slick looking steel and titanium frames. Uh, in particular, the Sobardo, which has been shared here uh, by Geronimo Cycles. Now, they actually got in touch with me via, I think, by Instagram and got email addresses, and they sent me a whole bunch of pictures. Uh, this all came from Pedro himself. Uh, really nice looking frame. So, on screen right now, you should be able to see this. So, it's a uh, basically a trail hardtail frame, and this is the titanium version. So you can get a steel one, as far as I know, uh, and that's made from Reynolds 853, so lovely tubing that, really, really nice, and certainly another great option. But I want to just talk to you about, about this. So you can see some shots of it on screen. Uh, it's made from a 3AL 2.5V uh, mix, uh, so it's 3AL uh, and 2.5 is vanadium. In there, as you know, that uh, it's an alloy, so it has a mixture of metals to help give it the correct properties. Now, the geometry and spec on this bike, so you've got 27 and a half inch wheels and it will accept up to a three inch tire, or 29 inch wheels up to 2.6, so you've got your choice there that you run. Uh, it's boost, 44 mil head tube, 31.6 um, diameter seat tube on there, and it'll suit a fork from 140 mil up to 160 millimeters, and they intend it to be used with a 44 mil offset or 44 mil rake on that fork. There's three sizes, medium, medium large, and large. Um, I always wonder when people say medium large, why not say small, medium large, but hey ho. Um, head angle 65 degrees, seat angle 75 degrees, chain stays 45, so very snappy out back there, so uh, that's gonna feel really agile and responsive. Uh, the reach on them, 438, 455, and 480, so pretty up to date in terms of sizing, and the frame sets are also completely custom, so you can have custom options in these available as well. I mean, titanium bikes, I've said this before, they have a beautiful ride quality, really, really nice to ride, uh, but the steel one, bowl accounts, should be very nice as well. Uh, so these retail from between uh, 1,849 euros to 1,999, uh, as I say, there's custom options as well. I'd never heard of them before, but really nice looking frames. Check them out. Next up, a new proof 2022. Now, I think I'm probably speaking for a lot of bike companies here that uh, supply chain is still an issue. So what Newproof have decided to do is release details of their frames and some of their limited edition bikes, uh, and the rest will follow, uh, just because of the fact they don't have everything, just like many other frames, uh, many other manufacturers out there. So we've got the limited edition Mega and Giga 297, so that's the mullet style edition, uh, with a 27 and a half inch wheel on the rear and 29 on the front. Now they come in team yellow. Uh, this is them on screen. So don't forget, both of them are very different bike designs. So you've got the Mega, slightly shorter travel, which has a four bar system configuration on there. And then you've got the Giga, the bigger Bruiser Brother, uh, which, which uses essentially a very similar back end to the Descent. Uh, so a single pivot with a linkage driving that shock there. Uh, but it pedaled so well 
on the descent, they decided to sort of do a custom um, prototype down the line. It ended up being a really good bike, so they've produced this one as well. Anyhow, so it comes with a Fox 38 Forker Float X2 shock on the rear, SRAM X01 and SRAM Code RSC brakes, so seeing a mixture of Fox and SRAM on there. A new proof Horizon wheels, which the team has been using. So 297 complete bike retails for 5,999, uh, 7,199 euros, and 7,799 in US dollars. And the Giga actually is identical in pricing. So 5,999, 7,199, and 7,799. Uh, really nice bike. Again, limited edition. They haven't actually said how limited in numbers as such, but. There is a model of bike available at the moment, and of course, more will follow next year. We believe uh, February they can make another announcement with stuff. Now, they've got some frame options. Uh, obviously, frames are going to be much easier to produce at this stage because you're not relying on the parts uh, problems that a lot of manufacturers are struggling with. So, they've got the Descent, which is a downhill frame. Uh, this is it on screen. Lovely grey paint job on there, and it's available in 275, 297, and 290 offerings. Uh, so 297, obviously, it's got a shorter back end on there, so you can run it with a smaller rear wheel. Three wheelbase settings, four progression settings, which I think is really, really cool. You can actually tailor the way the suspension feels, uh, not travel here. This is all about the progression of that back end. Some courses, you might want it really progressive for jumping and just hammering hard. Other courses where it's super rough and you're trying to pedal through stuff, you might want it a bit more linear, uh, so you're not getting too much feedback through the pedals. So great choices to have there. Uh, RockShox Deluxe Ultimate Coil Shock on there. Now the sizing on these, so the 290 comes in a medium large and an extra large, and the 275 and 297 models come in small, medium, large, and extra large. Uh, so kind of size specific there to a degree. Uh, 2,499 in pounds sterling, 2,399 in euros, and 2,699 in US dollars. Now I've also got the Giga and the Mega, both available in this cool black colorway. Uh, it looks like almost like a chrome raw style graphic on there, or the team yellow. Both of them look cool, but I really like the Team Yellow at the moment. I know it's super Larry, but it does look really cool. Uh, in the same way that you would have a Lamborghini in a kind of horrifically loud colour, it's got that kind of vibe to it. So both models, the uh, Giga and the Mega, are available in 275, 297 and 290 offerings. So that is two wheel size options and a mixed wheel size as well. They come with clear coat protection fitted. They both have the Fox Float X2 shock on the rear. Pricing on the Giga is 2,599 or 3,099 in euros and 3,499 in US dollars. Obviously, as the frame, it will come with uh, various bits and pieces, including that clear coat on there. I think it comes with a headset on there as well. Um, and the Mega is 2,499, 2,999, and 3,399 uh, pounds, euros, and US dollars, respectively. Reactor, a little bit more simplified, it's only available in 275 and 290 offerings. 275 small through to XL, uh, 290 medium through to XL sizing on that, uh, and that will be due to clearance issues if there weren't any smaller of the frames, I guess. 275 has 140mm rear travel, uh, the 290 has 130mm rear travel, that's my favourite of the two options there. Clear protection fitted on the frame, 2499, 2999 and 3399, and it comes in the same black and the same team yellow. And there's also the Cup Scout, uh, so essentially a smaller version of the Scout, available in 20 inch, 24 inch and 26 inch wheel options, uh, 399, 499 and 699 in pounds, euros and US dollars. Uh, nice selection and nicely someone offering something uh, because it is extremely difficult for the manufacturers to be doing this at this stage. Next up, Starling Stern V2. Now the original Stern was a high pivot single speed downhill bike and this is another version of that. Uh, now this uses a jack shaft system on this, it's essentially left hand drive to enable it to have that single uh, length of chain that runs from the idler wheel basically straight to the rear wheel. So single speed is going to be incredibly quiet. Some people might think, hmm, single speed down a bike, what's the point? Uh, well actually, you know, races have been won on these, so I can think a Masters World Champs type was won on one of these. And also the fact that it's an ideal bike if you just want to be a park rider and just smash chairlift runs or uplift runs all the time, nothing to break essentially. Now the jack shaft system on here does rely on having to have left hand specific cranks uh, because of that and as far as I know Profile and Middleburn are two of the only companies, although really good companies to choose from to be fair, uh, that are making cranks specific to the system. 200mm travel on the back, no chain growth, no mech to smash, no chain guide needed. 
as it is. Uh, jobs are good. And ISCG mounts on there, not for a chain guide, but for the option of putting a bash guard on. Uh, might be good depending on where you want to ride the thing. Uh, from 2,990 quid, uh, I think it's cool, if a bit niche, but it's definitely a super cool looking frame. Would a downhill bike that's a single speed appeal to you? Let us know in those comments underneath. Quiz time, three questions coming at you for the, uh, the inevitable quiz um, uh, on screen right now. Uh, first question, why do we have tapered steerer tubes on forks? So that will be a steerer tube that resembles that. Big at one end, a slimmer at the other end. Have a think about that, why is that? Uh, next up, what's the difference of a trunnion mounted shock versus a regular one? And the last question, picture on screen, what is the tool on the far left and what is it for? Pick up the answers in a bit. Okay, let's pick up some comments then from last week's show. Now there's, uh, I think we were talking a lot about the vertical and horizontal shocks and stuff like that. Uh, I wasn't really talking about suspension designs as such, just the way that well, uh, some people might have configured things differently. Uh, Flats MTP, good name, says, uh, regarding both horizontal and vertical, I think you should have added floating because the standard vertical rides totally differently to say the floating vertical of the Mondraker Zero setup. Um, well, to be honest, I didn't forget them. I was just trying to employ the actual mounting systems, not the suspension designs. Uh, yes, that is a very good suspension design, but there are other bikes that use a floating shock system out there, uh, but that doesn't affect really um, the shock position stuff. They've ended up using that because that's the suspension design that they wanted to have. Um, but yeah, but I mean, it's a very cool system. Uh, next up from Pete C811. Wicked show as always. I've never felt the need for a bottle cage. Um, it's just untidy. Hydro pack all the way for me. Small amount of water, room for snacks, tools, pump, phone, first aid kit, uh, just in case. Although I never needed it. Keep up the good work. Yeah, I mean, I think that's absolutely fine. I mean, it, you know, it doesn't seem too long ago to me that the Camelback kind of came out, ironically. Uh, and, and when that happened at the time, everyone was running water bottles, they were running saddlebags. You carried nothing on you. It was all on your bike. Um, and then we changed to running everything in a hydro pack, losing the weight of stuff off your bike, which was great from my perspective, because in that, you know, in the sort of early 90s, bikes were really heavy, so you wanted to take some of that weight off them. And now we're putting it all back on again, which, don't get me wrong, I love the convenience of using a bottle cage on a bike, and I do it myself for short rides, but still, the, the idea of putting more stuff on your bike and making it weigh more still puzzles me a little bit. Muttley. Hi, Doddy, loving the show. Uh, thank you very much, Muttley. Question about the custom Canada and top mods and the smooth welds. Would you do this yourself on a modern alloy bike or is it just a bad idea as it could infect the integrity of the welding? I love my bike, but I obviously think it would look nice with smooth welds. Um, I don't think you should do this to your own bike. Um, they designed their bikes specifically with that in mind when they were being constructed and fabricated. Um, now, welding is something I know not that much about, if I'm completely honest, because I've spent almost zero time doing it. I've done a very small amount of fillet brazing in the past, and a bit of arc welding, but nothing you know you could classify as proper welding. I'm sure some people will jump in in the comments down there. Uh, but Cannondale, I mean, I know when I've mentioned this before, saying that Cannondale had beautiful welding, and they always have done. They weren't trying to file down the welds to make their welds look neater as such like covering up bad welds. They would have had very, very good welds to start with. They just wanted their frame to have a seamless look to it. So don't confuse that, uh, anyone out there, of me suggesting that they were trying to make their bad welds look good, if that makes sense. They were just trying to make their bikes look as seamless as possible. And they have some of the best engineers and bike designers and manufacturers and fabricators working for them uh, around the world. So I don't think it was ever an example of uh, covering up bad stuff. Um, but yeah, I want to learn some more about this stuff in 2022. So it's kind of one of my aims of the year is just to learn more things. And hopefully I can teach you some of that stuff. Um, P.S. Can you move the neon in the background of your main shot down so you can see it and not just the cable? I know it's petty, but it's doing my nothing. Well, yeah, actually, Josh the cameraman, uh, he's told me that as well. I mean, to be fair, my defense, when I set it up, we were in lockdown at a time and I put it up on the wall at a height that felt right to me when I was self-filming. It uh, turns out it's nowhere near the right height. So yeah, we're gonna change that up. Don't worry, it's all good. Uh, we've actually got some conduit now, but I've not bolted it to the wall because uh, if we're gonna move it, we're gonna have to fill in some holes and repaint anyway. So we're gonna sort that out for next year, make it look nice and neat again. Uh, a couple of very helpful people gave us some tips for replacing steerer tubes. If you remember, I put a link to that shop that's based up in Stirling, I think they were. 
Um, so Jascha Heinz says, Lemon Shocks is based in Nuremberg, uh, and they can also fit new steerer tubes to forks. They even have extra stiff ones made by Intend. So that's a great shout out for you in Europe in particular, in Germany. And another one from Steve Krask, who says, RSF in Plymouth do steerer and stanchion replacements. So uh, now we've got somewhere down south and somewhere way up north. So super helpful, um, good resources for anyone out there that is struggling with a steerer tube that's too short. And actually, anyone that watched the Dirt Shed show, Martin was talking about exactly that. So they might want to check out those places as well. And the last one comes from TJS. Surely the idea for the Camelback came from my dromedary friends, uh, camels. Well, I don't think so. I told you the story of Camelback. Uh, the guy uh, that came up with it was a necessity of carrying water. I don't think he was inspired by a camel. He was just thinking of a way to carry it. However, the name clearly came from that. Um, Camelback. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, I guess you kind of have that one, do you? Okay, now it's time for Rewind. This is all about the cool stuff, uh, well, or not so cool stuff, where we came from, uh, showing you where we came from and why we have such good stuff today. So if you've got anything old, or if you wanna know anything about some older stuff, please do get in touch, uh, take some photos of the stuff, or just drop us an email or use the hashtag Rewind down there. I'd love to dig out some stuff for you uh, and try and teach everyone a bit more about where the bikes that we're riding today came from. So this week I actually wanna share something that I was reading. Now it is a story I've referred to in the past, but thanks to the Marin Museum of Bicycling, uh, which are based in Fairfax in Northern California, uh, essentially at the home of what we know as mountain biking, where it came from, that museum is absolutely amazing. So first up, give them a follow. Their Instagram handle is right there, and it's also down there in the links. Now they put this post up, so you're gonna see this on screen, and it's a shot of Cindy Whitehead riding her Ross bike, which I never knew at the time, actually isn't a Ross, it's actually a Klein bike. Uh, so I'm just gonna literally read this post out uh, because what they do on their Instagram is really cool. They're telling tales about mountain biking. It's really cool. If you wanna learn some stuff, it's definitely worth giving them some love. So they say, they're thrilled to receive Cindy Whitehead's race bike from her legendary win at the 1986, imagine this, all that time ago, Plumline Outback Sierra 7500. The endurance race climbed 7,500 feet, so that's 2,285 meters, over a 50 mile course, so that's 80 kilometers. I mean, cross country racing back then was hardcore. You know, it was like, can you get to the end? It wasn't like how fast can you get around it like it is these days. Um, the top pros competed, Mike Jordan, Bested, Casey, in fact, I don't need to read that. Uh, the woman's favorite, Jackie Phelan, battled Cindy Whitehead for the women's title, so this is really the story here. So Whitehead, racing for Ross Cycles, broke her saddle near the beginning of the race, and I've, I've probably shown you a photo of this before. Nonetheless, she pressed on, and she overtook the unbeatable Phelan and took the victory. It went down as pr the most improbable solo performance in bicycling history. Now the bike itself is an aluminium Klein, um, a mountain Klein, reached the museum, a sand saddle, after being carefully restored by a second spin, uh, and it's going to be joining the permanent collection next to Freeland's amazing Cunningham. And there's a shot of it as well. And there's a shot of it in that race with no saddle. Can you imagine doing a 50 mile mountain bike race at altitude, hammering it, winning it with no saddle, no option of sitting down, let alone the danger of slipping a pedal or whatever. Like that is just so gnarly and so cool to see the bike. There it is there on display. Um, what a great story behind a real cool iconic bike. Okay, now it's time for Bike Cave. Please do not forget that you can send your bike caves to us. There is a link right there and another one in the description down there. And the same goes for Bike Cave, for Rewind, for Top Mods. If you've got anything cool to share with us, please do get involved. I know that loads of you have and you haven't. So take some photos, tell us about yourself and use our uploader. It really is pretty easy to use. So this week's one is from Louis in New York City, which really confused me looking at this because it's all shot inside a cage. Uh, so he's got a uh, Yeti SB150 with Industry 9 wheels and a specialised rip rock expert for his boys. Um, living in New York City represents his own challenges for space and riding, but if you manage to have the right setup, everything is possible. With the help of a 2x2 two two cycle, um, I managed to rig my Vespa um, as a transportation beast. No way, okay, right. Um, and I'm now working on our own bike cave as a small storage unit. I hope you enjoy it. Um, and a top pro tip on this. So the bike cave is in, inside this like, locked cage. Uh, it's very cool actually. He says, pro tip, using my dog pee pads on, on the side of the worktop bench has been my own discovery. Helps keep it clean when greasing and cleaning parts. Well, I guess it's designed to soak up moisture in that. That's actually, 
I didn't even know, I haven't got a dog, so why would I know those things exist? But um, kind of reminds me of a nappy to a, uh, to a degree, same sort of concept. But um, you've made super good use of this space. So the hooks on the wall are actually the same ones we've got up on here, holding our bits and pieces on the wall. So good to see you're using decent storage hooks. It's nice, and there's the Yeti down there. It's kind of like quite an ominous looking place, isn't it, in that cage? But I really like what you've done. It looks awesome, Louis. And there's, there's that little Specialized hanging up. Oh man, that looks so good. Such a fun little bike. Great set of ground control tires on there. You have loaded this little place out, actually. It just shows what you can do with a small space if you actually really want to get something done. Anything's possible. Okay, so let's pick up some quiz answers now. So there's three questions. The first question was, does anyone know why we have tapered steerer tubes on forks? Now, originally, fork steerer tubes were a bit like this. Little skinny one inch steerer tubes. And over time, things changed. So Gary Fisher introduced the Evolution, which is 1.25, uh, but most of us went the inch and an eighth, which is 1.125 um, in sizing. Obviously, as forks got longer and wider and stiffer, uh, bigger travel, you start getting more flex here in this part of the bike. So if you think on a downhill fork or a motorcycle fork where you have a twin crown, you're spreading the load out. Yeah, so it's gonna be much stiffer. But on a single piece of steerer tube, you've got to support the fork under braking and with all the torsion that goes on, you're gonna encounter flex in this area. So what happened was, I think it was 2002, 2003, the 1.5 standard came out, which uh, ironically was called a standard, never actually became one. And they went up to a 1.5 steerer tube. So look at the difference between that to that. I mean, the difference between the fork speaks for itself. You could not have a fork this size with a steerer tube this size and have it ride very well. There would just be far too much flex. So they enabled an enormous crown to be mounted on the front of the fork. And the two brands that really sort of did this first was Manitou with their Sherman fork and then RockShox with the Totem fork. Both of them were designed as long travel, single crown forks. 170 mil travel, I'm gonna say, maybe 180. Uh, ironically close to where we are today, uh, except today we're using a tapered steerer tube. Now, the reason of going to the tapered steerer tube is, let's face it, this was absolutely massive. Accordingly, the head tubes on bikes were absolutely massive to go with that. And it became ugly and the stems were unnecessarily heavy. You think how compact stems were on a bike like this, like 50 mil stem. It had to be giant in order to cater to clamp around the steerer tube. So we then moved to tapered, which has 1.5 at the bottom end and inch and eighth at the top. Now, by going to the tapered system, you retain the strength and rigidity where you really need it, the interface between the steerer and the crown. That's where all the flex is handled, and the top, you don't need it there. So we've gone back to having something lighter at the top, you have your standard style stems that clamp onto the top there, and you get all that stiffness back. So, uh, well, there you go. That's the steerer tube story, I guess you could say. Uh, next up, what's the difference of a trunnion mounted shock versus a regular one? Uh, well, the shock itself mounts directly, so you don't have eyelets, have I got a trunnion mounted shock? I haven't. Unfortunately, I'm going to show you. There'll be one on screen. So this is a trunnion mounted shock, and this is a more conventional shock. So the shock has to be a certain size in order to fit in the frame. You have your eye to eye length, and you have the stroke length. Now, sometimes on some frame designs, you'll end up with the actual body of the shock will be quite short comparatively for how much stroke it has. And accordingly, it becomes very hard for a suspension designer to configure a shock that's gonna offer the same performance as all of the other sizes in the range in that same model. So the theory was when they brought out the metric style system of measuring the eye to eye length, this catered for the fact that you could have a trunnion shock. So the trunnion shock, you would have the mounts going directly into the shock and you're losing the eyelet. So the shock body could become taller and you mount directly into it. And the idea of having the shock body being taller, uh, the major reason was the fact you could have consistency between all sizes. So no matter what shaft stroke you had on your bike or what length the shock was, it would perform the same as whatever other size it was in the same equivalent model. Uh, you also had the benefit of the mounting system as well, offering a few other things. Now, although this isn't one, bearing mounts directly into the actual shock itself, you can see those on certain shocks. And then also on other shocks, like this really old school GT that you can see on screen here, had a threaded trunnion star mount. So again, it would be mounted at the top there, but by threading the shock up and down within the mount, you could adjust the geometry of the bike. Now we haven't seen that on modern shocks, but it's just another way of saying you can mount the shock in a different way. And essentially it's to help give you great performance. Um, there you go. 
And lastly, what is the tool on the far left for? It's a dummy steerer tube. It's basically one of these. So it's really for bike shop, um, bike shop mechanics, uh, but anyone that's really serious about working on the bike, when you've got to repair a fork or take a fork out to do a certain job on a bike, you've got to delicately dangle the handlebars down, hang in from the control cables and hoses, and you've got to make sure you have all the headset components in place. Now, if you're working in a shop, being able to bosh that straight up in place, in, in place of your fork, you don't even need to change the, uh, the crown brace on there because you've got a rubber one built onto here. Um, and holding it all together while you go work on the fork, the bike can then be hung up out of the way. It's just a great solution. Yeah, you could arguably make one yourself, but it's an all-in-one product. Uh, real cool, so that's the Park Tool DF1. A wicked little tool, actually, that I love using. There you go. How did you get on? Um, I'd love to know what you thought of the show as well. Let us know in the comments underneath anything you didn't know that I told you, or perhaps uh, anything you disagreed with. Always welcome to pick that up in the comments, and we'll see you in next week's show. Ta-ra. <laughs>